All right, hey guys. I hope everyone's in the right place. Um, so hey, again, thanks for attending our talk. Uh, this is the 25-minute turbo talk on uh, an embedded system called Twine. Um, so embedded devices are increasingly becoming a focus of security research. And uh, if you've ever worked with um, or, you know, tried to perform your own assessment of an uh, embedded system, you may understand some of the uh, challenges that you're faced with and some of the workarounds that you came up with. Um, but if you haven't, hopefully uh, after this talk you'll have some insight. Um, that's really, you know, how we wanted to frame this talk. Um, because we're security guys, we're software security guys. We don't know much in the hardware aspect of security. So, you know, this was something that we were really interested in uh, getting into. Um, so, of course, this is a turbo talk. If you have any questions, please hold them to uh, the end of our talk. Uh, so about us, uh, I'm John Chittenden. This is Anson Gomes. Um, we're security consultants with ISEC Partners. We're based in New York. Um, we're, yeah, we're based in New York. Um, this was a, uh, a project that had three members of our team. The other was Glenn Saunders who unfortunately couldn't attend Black Hat. Uh, so just, just sort of like a backstory on Twine. Uh, Twine came up as, uh, well someone just sent us a Kickstarter link, uh, one of our colleagues, and we were really interested in it. We watched the video. We were said, hey, this is a cool product. Let's buy one and poke around with it and see what we can find. Uh, so today we'll talk about Twine, what it is, how you would use it. Then we'll also just talk about our setup, our analysis, what we found, and then ultimately um, some solutions for this. So what is Twine? Twine is an uh, a embedded system that was created by a startup in Austin called Super Mechanical. And essentially uh, their marketing material suggests that it allows you to connect your things to the internet. Um, oh yeah, and without a nerd degree which I think is kind of cute. Um, but at any rate, essentially what it allows you to do is detect changes in your environment wherever Twine is and then communicate these changes to you. So uh, as a use case example, let's say your basement was prone to flooding you may connect a moisture sensor to your twine and then once that's connected, uh, when it detects wetness or moisture, um, it will communicate that to you. Uh, so you can break it up into a couple of components. Uh, the first is the input. So for twine, you have your environment and the sensors are constantly pulling. Um, you have a variety of sensors here and it's constantly pulling um, and then packaging up and sending this out to the uh, twine backend. Now the twine backend allows you to create this uh, conditional rules. So if a certain condition is met then, you know, perform this certain um, output. So uh, the output could be, you know, Twitter, SMS, text messaging, whatever it is. Um, and this isn't an exhaustive list. Uh, Super Mechanical is constantly improving Twine, updating it and, you know, rolling out new, new types of sensors. Uh, so why Twine? Well, it was a black box. It was interesting to us. Uh, we didn't know much about it at the time and it had a nice overlay of software security and hardware security. Um, to that end, you know, the embedded system in it, you know, has the wireless access point, right? Um, it also has a web server, two different types of firmware on there um, and some other really interesting components. Um, so as far as like the attack surface goes, it's varied, right? There's a lot going on here. There's a lot of interesting components. And as I mentioned, we're software security guys sort of delving into the world of hardware security. So it was a nice little overlap. Um, as far as the application components go, you have a web server. So when you configure Twine, you flip it over, um, it becomes its own wireless access point and you can con connect to that. Once you've connected to it, it has its own local web server where you will actually set up and configure the device itself. Um, so once it's configured, you flip it back over, it connects to your wireless access point and then, um, you know, have fun with it, right? So as far as like the uh, other components go, uh, the rule sets, uh, these are the conditional rule sets that I mentioned earlier and then it's also communicating over TCP and UDP. Um, as far as the hardware components go, you have this uh, gain span system on a chip. This is really the brains of Twine itself. Um, Within, uh, within this gain span chip, uh, we'll show it later, but it's got its own wireless access point and this is really, you know, where all that functionality is coming from. Uh, on the Twine board, you also have data storage, its own Twine firmware um, and then, of course, your variety of sensors. Uh, so just a quick recap of Twine. We have this black box which is really just a green box but if you remove this sleeve uh, and go a little bit deeper, here's Twine in all its glory, uh, naked. Um, and here, 
right here is the uh, gain span system on a chip. If you look up here on the top right, you can see uh, the antenna, and that's where uh, the wireless functionality is. Um, you can also, if you're, for a keen observer, you might notice the micro US, uh, excuse me, micro USB input. That's mostly for powering it. That's not for um, debugging. Um, and then also for um, on the gain span chip, you'll notice uh, the pins on the right and left of the chip. Um, that'll come up again later, but that's where your UART and JTAG um, and a bunch of other uh, interesting little pins are. On the side here, we have a sensor, um, and it's connected to Twine via 3.5 millimeter jack. Um, yeah. All right. So, like uh, John said, Twine was a black box device, and we knew nothing about it. The only thing that we knew was that Twine communicated with super mechanical s web servers. It monitored the environment, uh, you know, through all the, uh, all the sensors, gathered all this data, sent it to the super mechanical servers. So we knew that there was some sort of communication, and the and that was like our entry point. We wanted to target this and you know get into the middle of this communication, either passively sniff it or actively man in the middle of this communication, through a, you know, with a proxy and uh, change, uh, you know, try playing around with it. So this can be a little tricky at times, you know, if you want to set up something. It's, it's, Twine is a wireless sensor block, and if you want to set up, uh, you know, if you want to man in the middle of this, you want to get, into, uh, you want to man in the middle of the actual access point, and uh, we've got to create our own access point for this. If you want to, you know, uh, get rid of all the noise on the network, all the noise that's been sent across the wire. So this can use, I mean, you, you need some special hardware as well as software for this. You need uh, something, uh, in, in, in terms of hardware, you need a, a chipset that supports master mode and software. You need host APD which sets up the access point. You also need a DHCP server for leasing out IP addresses. Uh, IP tables need to be configured to uh, allow proxying as well as forwarding traffic between, uh, uh, you know, the, the device itself that's connected to the internet. Uh, it can be a little tough and uh, you know we decided to go u with the Wi-Fi pineapple which does all of this out of the box. It sets up an access point and, and uses and uses IP addresses. It also uh, with a little tweaking you can get it a man in the middle of network communication. So uh, using this we had a, a, a neat little setup. You know this was our setup. We had uh, Twine talking to the Wi-Fi pineapple wirelessly. And uh, the Wi-Fi Pineapple was connected to the Wi-Fi uh, wi adapter of uh, our laptop, and all the proxying and monitoring of this network traffic happened on the laptop, which is connected to the internet using the Ethernet port. Uh, we configured uh, IP forwarding to, uh, you know, to we, so we had to create a, a route between the Ethernet ta uh, port as well as the Wi-Fi adapter, and uh, uh, you know, we used IP forwarding to to allow traffic between the, the these two uh, adapters. If you want more information about this, there's a neat little article that I've written on uh, the ISEC blog, and uh, you can use that for uh, more information. So uh, we had all this set up. We were now man in the middling the actual network, uh, the communication between uh, Twine and its super mechanical uh, web server. <coughs> uh, but we still, you know, we ran into a little bit of uh, trouble right there. I mean, Twine communicates over a couple of high order ports, nothing to uh, uh, be concerned about. but. Proxying really didn't help much because uh, Twine, I mean, some of the traffic between Twine and the super mechanical servers are act is actually encrypted. And uh, so we basically ended up looking at uh, all the packet captures that we'd, uh, you know, captured using Wireshark. We, uh, that was what we based our, most of our analysis off of. So, right, as uh, Anson, Anson mentioned, at this point we have a bunch of wireless PCAP files. Um, and we understand that Twine is at some, at some level communicating with the Twine backend, but we don't know how. We don't really understand the protocol. So we began pouring over um, the Wireshark captures, and you know, you had these data blobs that looked a lot like this. Now, granted, you would have the ASCII representation of some of these characters, so uh, this might pop out to you. Uh, this is actually Poll, so P O L L. Um, and if you think about it a little bit, if you were performing malware analysis and you wanted to know how a piece of malware communicated with the CNC server, uh, you need to take a step back and realize that, hey, uh, this is a well-defined language that it's speaking, right? Um, it needs to know how, how much to parse into uh, the hex stream or the binary stream and understand, all right, this is, you know, uh, the, the field for the type of message, a poll message. So to fill in these sort of blanks and understand um, the protocol, uh, we would begin looking further back into the, um, 
the prefix values here. So here we have a four. This actually signifies the data type length, which is the next four bytes are five. So it's an integer. It's a it's an integer type, and that's actually the length of the poll message with a null terminated string, right? So if you take that simple example and apply it to the rest of it, things start to become more clear and you start to understand how Twine is actually working. So the poll message itself is um, essentially just a heartbeat with the uh, Twine backend. Um, and here we have a number of different fields, the Twine identifier which is unique to every Twine, the message type, uh, the firmware version and the RSSI which is the received signal strength indicator. Uh, and that's again just the Wi-Fi signal strength with the access point. Um, and now the server will respond in a couple of different manners. Uh, the first is just generally a null which does do nothing. Um, and then the second or the, the last two wake up and arm flash are linked together. It's essentially waking up the twine device and preparing it to be uh, updated and flashed. So um, in addition we have the UDP data message. Um, and as Anson had hinted at there is some sort of encrypted magic happening. Well it turns out that the UDP data message is all the sensor data being transmitted to um, the Twine backend. And again, you know, if we look back here at the TCP messages, they follow a very similar pattern. We have the Twine ID, the message type, so this is a UDP data message. Um, and then we have this huge encrypted blob, right? Well it turns out that this encrypted blob is all the sensor data, um, everything on the onboard Twine device and everything connected to it it gathers this all up, encrypts it and then packages it and sends it out to uh, the Twine backend. So just to recap, um, we have two avenues of communication occurring here. We have one from the server to Twine and then one from uh, Twine to the server. Um, Twine to the server is occurring over TCP and UDP, it's roughly every 45 seconds. Um, and from server to Twine, this is predominantly uh, or only over TCP um, and we have three different um, responses, null, wake up and arm flash. Um, and now the, the updating process for the arm flash, this could be for rules if you were pushing down new rules to Twine or if you were to update the actual uh, Twine software. So we've seen that uh, <coughs> some of the data sent between uh, Twine and Super Mechanical is actually encrypted. But uh, we've also seen that at least the poll message isn't. You know, we can see uh, the actual poll message and the responses sent from the super mechanical servers, and that's all in plain text. So uh, this here is a screenshot of a packet capture where, uh, we, you know, when we s when we updated the rules on the website, it sent down a, uh, these uh, it sent down these rules to the Twine device itself, and. Uh, here, if you look a little closer, we see uh, Jonathan's email address as well as the message that uh, Twine is supposed to send to his email account. You know, this is personally identifiable information, and uh, it shouldn't really be, uh, you know, publicly accessible to anyone that's sniffing on the network. You want to protect this with some sort of uh, network, uh, you know, network uh, security uh, uh, protocol, and. Uh, just prevent any unwanted information from being uh, displayed or accessible to anyone passively sniffing on the network. Well, this is uh, this is plain text message. What about encrypted message? We know that the sensor data that's being sent across from Twine to uh, the servers is actually encrypted. But uh, I mean, the simplest thing when in an encrypted message is just replaying that, and uh, that's exactly what we did. Let me pull up a real quick demo right here. So, uh, so this is our script, and uh, we just basically call it fake twine, and we sent, uh, you know, like a lot of data from uh, us to the, to, the, to the servers. This is a, a baseline message, and you can see here that it updates. You can see that uh, the last update was five seconds ago. If we replay the message again, you see that it has changed, and it is, uh, it's, you know, it's detected that twine sent a message uh, like just, you know, just a second ago. Uh, in the same way we can re we can get you know after capturing sensor data we can get it to replay all this sensor information like uh, we can tell t uh, you know we can trick the server into thinking that twine is wet by just sending it uh, a packet data a udp packet with the sensory data for uh, it being wet uh, the same way f uh, if it's dry you know if we change it to dry we see that it's dry so this is just replaying all the packet data and uh, I mean, 
it, the, the first thing when you're building a protocol, you don't want to basically replay all this, uh, you know, you, you, you don't want it to be susceptible to a replay attack. Uh, it's networking 101 and uh, things like this should be uh, avoided. Uh, so that was the encrypted data but what would be sweeter is if we could actually try getting the encryption key. Uh, so we have access to Twine and uh, we thought that uh, you know maybe interacting with it, getting terminal output or access, you know if we could, if we could send it some commands or uh, try interacting with the file system maybe you could get somewhere with this. Uh, so that's exactly what we did next. Uh, so we tried getting terminal output and in order to do this you need to understand the hardware. Uh, we knew, I mean, we knew the serial numbers of the chips. We knew everything uh, about the hardware on the on the on the board itself. And a little googling around got us the data data sheets for these uh, chipsets. And uh, you know, when after reading all these all the all these chipsets, we realized that Twine has the, this the gain span chip has a lot of uh, interfaces that you can interact with. Uh, here is a screenshot of uh, the pinout from the data sheet and you can see it has a couple of UART ports. It's got uh, JTAGs as well and if you look on top it's got the SSPIs as well as uh, GPIOs. Interesting uh, interfaces that you can interact with Twine and we decided to stick with, uh, I mean, you know, being a uh, software security profession we decided to stick with uh, the easiest which is the UARTs and uh, we used the hands for that, you know. We used the fingers and connected the pinouts and uh, bang, we got terminal output. So if you look at this, it's pretty, you know, it's pretty standard. It's, it's booting for the first time. You see the version ID, uh, the version number which is the date and timestamp which you've also seen in the uh, uh, packet captures. You also see the twine ID. I mean this confirms our, you know, our uh, initial uh, thought that uh, that was the actual twine identifier in the packet. And you see the MAC address as well. What is interesting is uh, the PSK. Now when I see a PSK in, uh, in, you know, in any output, it's always, okay, what is that? It's supposed to be something sensitive. And if you go down further, you see that it's, that, uh, you know, Twine is actually trying to connect with the pineapple SSID and the PSK is valid. So putting two and two together, you can come to a conclusion that uh, the PSK is the actual encrypted password for uh, joining the Wi-Fi network. And, uh, that's actually true. At some operating systems, you know, you don't even need the, the password. Uh, you can just in input the PSK and uh, get connected to uh, the network directly. Additionally, you can also see, uh, you know, that it's trying to connect to super mechanical servers, sending it a poll message, UDP uh, uh, message as well, the size of the UDP packet that it's actually sending. Uh, some of this is a little sensitive, including the PSK, and you wouldn't want to have, you know, a a device that's in production that's displaying uh, all these messages that should be accessible only in uh, in debug mode or something like that. Uh, so this is terminal output and just to recap, uh, you need to find three pins, ground, transmit, receive. There's a, there's a nice article that shows you exactly how to do that. And once you've located these three pins, you need to connect it to a uh, laptop using a, a, a USB to a serial, U uh, uh, sorry, a UR to USB, serial USB connector. Make certain you have the drivers installed to interact with the hardware. And you also need to uh, use uh, TerraTerm, uh, uh, I mean you need to use a terminal emulator for printing output, uh, something like TerraTerm or XTerm. And you also need to find the, the baud rate for the device. In, ter in, in Twine's case, it was 115200. Now there is no easy way of uh, finding the baud rate. It's through trial and error. There's a finite uh, number of baud rates and you just have to, you know, cycle through each and uh, every one of those so you get the, uh, the correct one. You can write a script. There are scripts out there which do that for you. But once you have all this configuration data, you get uh, terminal output. So uh, we now had terminal output but uh, it was a read only terminal and instead of you know messing around with any of the other, uh, other interfaces, we thought about what about dumping the firmware. You know if we can dump firmware may maybe we could get something sensitive, maybe something interesting would pop up. And that's what we did next. So uh, we used some special hardware which is uh, an 8 pin SOIC clip and a USB to MPSC serial cable. Uh, and you need uh, some software to talk to the, to the flash memory and that's libmpsc. So using the, this combination of hardware and software we dumped uh, the actual firmware from the device itself and uh, then we had to analyze it. So we used binwalk for this. What binwalk does is it uh, detects the actual file, file segments in the, sorry, the, the, the offsets for the files in that actual firmware 
and uh, you can use Binwalk to extract those uh, file chunks. So th that screenshot that you see right there is uh, Binwalk being used on the Twine uh, flash that we dumped, and you can see that it is, uh, you know, it's. Uh, uh, it's uh, extracted about five uh, gzipped files, which were the actual uh, HTML web pages that uh, Twine sets up with the web server. You know that uh, John mentioned earlier during the setup process. Uh, the, the the GIF image is the actual Twine logo, and the LZMA compressed image. Now that's interesting. That was a binary file that uh, you know we could then load up into IDA and start and just start start reverse engineering it. I'm not going to talk about this due to time constraints, but. Uh, that's one side of the firmware that we actually dumped and uh, st you know started reverse engineering. There is another firmware that you can dump as well, and uh, that's uh, through the packet capture. So John mentioned that there are two types of uh, you know updates that are sent down to uh, to mine itself. One is a hardware update for the system on a chip, and the other is uh, the firmware that's pushed down to uh, Twine in you know uh, when you make an update to the rules rule sets. And uh, so this screenshot is. Uh, is is a, a, a packet capture of the uh, firmware being pushed down to Twine. It starts off with, with Twine sending a poll message, the server responding with an ARM flash, and Twine says, "All right, let's start the flash." And the CRC checks, uh, and uh, it then sends this entire chunk of data, which is uh, a firmware. And we use dpacket and Python to extract this firmware. Again, you know, once you've extracted it, it's uh, all about reversing that uh, firmware, and. Uh, that's where we're at at this point. All right. So to uh, sort of wrap things up, you know, the Internet of Things is one of these buzzwords that's uh, around a lot, and security research is definitely focusing on embedded systems. Um, you know, as far as uh, like small startups go, they're starting to s get into this space a little bit more, and you're seeing more devices and more things being added to this Internet of Things. So, um, you know, we find it necessary for people to sort of understand some of the security and privacy risks. Um, in Twine's example, uh, you know, they could simply just extend their current crypto implementation to protect uh, the user data that's being leaked. Um, then also as far as their protocol goes, you know, fixing a replay attack is, you know, should be fairly trivial I would think. Um, you know, just include some sort of timestamp or nonce and have some sort of logic to verify that. Um, that said, also don't print sensitive data to consoles on production devices. Um, and with that, uh, we're sort of done. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask now or contact us via uh, email or Twitter. <laughs> Thank you.